I have a topic today. I've been doing a sermon series in my church um, all last year, and I'm still not done with it. Um, but I thought Dan tells me so much about Destiny Church and how smart you guys are. And so what I decided to do is preach my whole sermon series, squish it together and put it in one sermon because I know um, that's enough for you guys and you will get it because you do look smart. Dan, you're right about that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. I, let me pray and then um, we'll get going. Jesus, I, pr I ask that you speak today through me by your spirit, in your name, amen, amen. Um, we have a magic fridge at home. I don't know if anybody else has one of these. Um, sometimes I go to our fridge and I open it up to get the ketchup bottle out and there's no ketchup bottle inside of the fridge. I close the door, my wife goes up to the fridge, opens the fridge, and right there in the middle of it, she sees it right away. It's a magic fridge, amazing. Uh, anybody else has one of those? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> pretty much everybody, huh? Um, sometimes it's easy to overlook things, especially for the men of us, isn't it? Um, and um, I think sometimes we can even overlook important concepts of our faith. Um, I studied in the States. Um, I went to school in Chicago. And one of the books we had to read is Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem. It's a 1,200 pages and... Um, you have to get really good at skim reading. Yeah? You just, there are some chapters that you really want to study, study, and other chapters you just kind of read you know, the headings and you go, ah, I already know that, or I don't need to know that. And there was this one chapter in this book that I read the heading and I thought, uh, I kind of know that and it's not that interesting anyway. And I just kind of read all of the subheadings and I marked it off on my test as, Read, read it, um, and then I moved on to the next chapters that seemed more interesting. Um, I'm convinced today that the chapter that I skipped is probably the most important chapter that I should have read, and it's that chapter that has transformed my life since, um, and I'm convinced that, it, that it's one of the key aspects of our faith. Um, if I were to ask you this question... Um, what's Paul's, the Apostle Paul's, favorite expression? What he uses the most? If you would discuss this in your small group, um, what would you say? Think about that for your second. I'm convinced many might say something like, fear not. Yeah? We all have heard often that fear not um, is a command that's repeated very often in the Bible. Um, and it is it is there often. Um, we have, uh, after the Gospels, we have 77 uses of um, the word phobos, so fear or fear not. Um, can you just click? I, I don't think my clicker is working yet. Perfect. So fear not is used about 77 times um, in the gospel. There's one other phrase that Paul uses 168 times. And the phrase is this, it's en Christu, in Christ. Or there are, there are different alternative expressions of that. Sometimes he says, um, in him or in Jesus, but it's always the same thing that's meant by that. Um, the German theologian Adolf Deismann, he says the following, he says, um, being in Christ, or specifically in Christ, is Paul's favorite terminology because he uses it virtually on every single page of his writing. So when I had my systematic theology, I got to the chapter of union with Christ, that we are in Christ. And when I first saw the topic, I thought, yeah, I kind of, you know, I kind of know, and it's not that interesting. And today, um, I'm convinced that it's not only Paul's favorite phrase um, in the New Testament, it maybe should also be ours, um, and it certainly has become um, mine. Um, so we, um, we oftentimes miss it, uh, and the question is why? If it's so important, and if Paul says it all the times, why do we miss it? 
And I think there's two reasons why um, we miss it. First of all, um, I think it's often concealed by Bible translation. Okay, so oftentimes you might not actually see the expression in Christ um, in your Bible. Um, I have one example for you, a Bible verse that most of you know because it's so beautiful. Um, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Um, that's a translation that's given by most of the translation. If you read it literally, it says, I can do this, and then there's the Greek word en, our word in, in the one who strengthens me. Okay, so here, one example of a Bible verse where the in Christ, the in him, is kind of hidden. Yeah? Um, I'm also convinced that, and that's my second point, um, that it's not only concealed by Bible translation, um, oftentimes it's concealed by our interpretation. I have another verse for you up here um, where you can see that really well. Ephesians 1, 3, it says, Praise be to God the f and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed that in us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Imagine you're at a Bible study and you have to tell your group what you notice about this verse. If I were in a Bible study, there's many things that we can start discussing about this. Yeah. So first of all, if I would have Jehovah's Witnesses knock at my door, they would ask, why is the Father and the Son mentioned but not the Spirit? What's happening here? And so we, we could discuss about that. Yeah. And then we could ask, what is the heavenly realms and what does that mean? And what does it mean to have all spiritual blessings? Yeah, and so the Bible study goes on and on and on, and we have talked about all those things, and then there's this little phrase right in the end, in Christ. And it seems so insignificant that it's there, isn't, doesn't it? And I think one of the reasons why it seems so insignificant is because we always interpret it right away in a certain way. Um, so you might read this as we have every spiritual blessing in Christ. And what does in Christ mean? You might read through Christ. Uh, so how do we have that? Why do we have that? Well, because of Christ or through Christ. So we do kind of the same thing that the Bible translations did. yeah, And re re we re replace in with because of or with through. Um, that's very possible grammatically to do that but there also in Greek there's a word dia that you can use for because of or through um, and I believe whenever the Greek word n is used it is not only to express a means with it ca which it can but always to express a location okay so you have received every spiritual blessing because you're in Christ yeah? um, I hope that I'm going to talk about this for the next now 25 more minutes or so. Um, and my hope is that by the end of this sermon, you will never be able to not see that in the Bible anymore. And it will become a new meaning for you. Um, I have a picture um, of myself here in church. Sometimes I do announcements like that. Um, and if you see the picture, it's not that great of a picture. I just took a screenshot. You First of all, you might notice different things. Yeah, you might notice, man, why is this guy's face so yellow, or so orange, or he's kind of blurry, or okay, he has books in the background, is he trying to look smart, or what, you know, what's going on? You, you, there's a lot of things that you could notice. Um, what if I were to tell you, it's not super obvious to see, but in that um, left upper, or in that right upper corner, there's a picture of my dog in a suit. Can you kind of see that? Like, are you kind of able to see it? Um, that's Mr. Darcy, that's our dog, and he has this Baroque, beautiful um, dress gown on, and we got that picture once from, uh, um, from our brother-in-law. I love it. It's beautiful. Um, if I were to, can we go away from the picture real quick? Um, and then we show the picture again. The first thing you will notice is not that my face, my face is yellow or orange. The first thing you'll notice is probably Mr. Darcy in his Baroque gown, right? So once you've seen it, you cannot ever unsee it again. 
And so if you ever were to look at announcements in my church now, you would immediately look for the picture of Mr. Darcy. Yeah? I hope today what's happening is that you can never unsee the in Christ references in the Bible ever again. So what's the significance of union with Christ, the fact that we are in Christ. Um, as every good preacher, I have a certain amount of points today that I want to cover. How many points is that? Three, you were, then you taught them well. Amazing. <laughs> it's three points today. Um, and my first point is this. Um, being in Christ um, is the defining mark of every um, Christian. It's what defines you as a Christian. There are many people from different nations here in this room, which is amazing. And if I were to ask you, what makes you an American? Or what makes you an Indian? Or a Brit? Or, or whatever you are? Um, that's not so easy to answer, is it? So if I were to ask, what makes me a German? I might say, well, I've been born here. But I know several people who have been born here, but then moved abroad and lived their whole lives abroad. And they don't consider themselves Germans just because they were born here. Um, I could also say I'm German because I have a German passport. But I also know a lot of people that have German passports that don't necessarily identify as Germans. Yeah? So the question is, what makes me a German? Here, here's what I believe makes me a German. Um, if you um, if you are on the streets two o'clock in the morning um, and you are walking and you are about to cross a street, yeah, and there's a there's a traffic light and um, and it's two o'clock in the morning. There's not a car. You can see a mile this way. You can see a mile this way. It's obviously safe, um, but the traffic light says no walking. Yeah, it's red. Um, <sighs> That little hesitation that I have, yeah, if I should or shouldn't do it, that's essentially the core of my Germanness, isn't it? Um, but really, when we think about it, it's not so easy to uh, um, have you defined as a human being or as a, a native of, of your country. Um, and it's also not super easy to say, what does it actually mean to be a Christian? The word Christian itself is in the Bible only a couple times, and when it's used, it's used derogatorily. So it's like saying, oh, those are like little Christs. Um, the church only way later has made it to the terminology that's used for us as Christians. Sometimes Christians in the Bible are called followers of the way but it's also pretty rare. Here's what we are, um, what Paul does, and I think that's absolutely beautiful. Um, Paul does it in um, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2, for example. There, um, he talks about a man who had a vision, and then he talks about the vision. It's, he's probably talking about himself. Um, but the way he describes this man is he says, it's an anthropos, a man or woman, en Christo. A man in Christ. So when Paul wants to say there was a Christian, he says there was an anthropos in Christu. There was a man in Christ. That's how he defines a Christian. Or in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, it's that passage where it talks about you know, the end times and the second coming of Christ. And then he talks about the dead. And he says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So how does he describe dead Christians? He said, well, they're the dead in Christ. They're the dead in Christ. So I believe um, there's many, many more that I could have shown you, um, but we don't have a full year today. So um, I believe that to be a Christian means by definition to be in Christ. Um, one author said the following. Um, he said when the New Testament describes what it means to be a Christian, it uses a phrase that's everywhere in Paul's letters, but, al but almost nowhere in our churches. And I, and I felt really, um, that kind of hit me hard because it's, because it's not in my church a lot. We don't talk about it that way. Um, 
The Heidelberg, I love, I love the catechisms of the church because they so beautifully and oftentimes simply describe the, the key fundamental truths of, of our Christian faith. And the Heidelberg catechism in question 32, so oftentimes they're like question and answers. Um, it asks question 32, but why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ. Because I am in Christ, it's saying here. So, um, being in Christ is what defines you as a Christian. Um, so next time, I know we don't do this and that's weird and that's just not how we talk, but um, next time when somebody in your family on the streets or whatever asks you about kind of what religion you follow or what you believe or whatever, um, can you just tell them, I'm a man in Christ? Or I'm a woman in Christ. I know that's weird. We don't do that, right? But it technically would be correct to say it that way. I'm an anthropos in Christu. Um, so being in Christ is what defines you as a Christian. Definition of being a Christian. Okay, um, then we have uh, my second point. Being in Christ means sharing in his life or in his experience. I want you to imagine the following thing. Imagine you are at an airport and you sit in your terminal and there's this big beautiful window and you look outside and your plane is already out there waiting for you. Yeah? So you can finally fly to Chicago to eat some good deep dish pizza. Anybody know deep dish pizza from Chicago? Yeah, it's a reason to go over there, isn't it? So you wait for your flight to Chicago, you see your airplane already, and now there's different types of relationships that you could have with that airplane. Um, you could, for example, be under the airplane, or under the authority of the airplane, you could say. Um, would that get you to Chicago? No. Um, you could, let's try something else, you could try to follow the plane. Um, but that also would probably be a little hard, huh? following the plane. Um, you could be um, um, inspired by the plane. You think, oh, that, that plane is so amazing, and one day I want to be with like that. Um, probably you're never going to be like that, because that plane just has abilities that you don't have. So there's different types of relationships that you can have to that plane that doesn't really and fully help you. If you want to get to your destination, where do you have to be in relation to the plane? Obviously, you have to be in the plane. Um, and what's interesting is when you're in the plane, what happens to the plane also happens to you. Yeah? Um, Sometimes um, my wife, um, she flies a lot for, for her job and um, sometimes I, I'm on flight aware or whatever and, and I look where she's at at the moment. Somebody else uh, does that in the room and loved ones fly. Um, and we, I, all, I always know where Kristen is, but really I don't. I know where the airplane is. And because I know where her airplane is and I know she's in her airplane, I can draw the logical conclusion yeah, of where she is at. So if, the, if I see on flight aware that the airplane suddenly in the middle flight, it turned around and it landed back in Frankfurt, I know that my wife is not in Chicago. Yeah? So by knowing where the airplane is, I know um, where she is. What happens to the plane happens to you. I believe that's the same thing um, if we are in Christ. Um, as Christians, we are in him, and we can say what happens to him happens to us, and what happens to us happens to him. Um, I have a list of phrases here um, that the Apostle Paul uses all over, um, and I think they're really helpful in kind of un trying to understand that concept. Okay, um, so his life is our life, yeah? like the airplane, we are where he is. It happens to us what happens to him. So the Bible says, I used to find those so obscure and I never knew what to do with it until I started to understand our theology of union with Christ and us being in him. We are, it says, crucified with him, Galatians 2, 
20 and Romans 6. We are nailed to a cross with him, Galatians 2, 19. We are buried with him, Colossians 2, 12. We are baptized into Christ and in his death, Romans 3, 6. We are we're united with him in his resurrection, Romans 6, 5. And we are seated with him in the heavenly places, Ephesians 2, 6. That's only a few of all of the references of where our life is almost like equaled with Christ's life. And I know this is still somewhat abstract because we understand time's linear. And so if something happened to Christ in the past, how can it also happen to us? And if something happens to Christ in the future, how I know, it's, I know there's complexity, there's mystery in that. But I think it's incredibly beautiful to say that where Christ is, I am. What happens to Christ also happens to me. Um, there's a mystery and a beauty in that. Um, by the way, it also happens the other way around. Um, his life is our life, but our life also is his life. In Acts, four, uh, Acts 9, verse 4, that's the moment of the Apostle Paul's conversion. Um, and he hears that voice come from heaven. And the voice says, uh, he fell to the ground. And the voice said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute all the Christians? No, that's not what it says, yeah? It says, why do you persecute me? Huh? Um Paul never persecuted Jesus because Jesus, in Paul's mind, was dead in the grave. There, there's no purpose in persecuting him. Yeah, he persecuted the Christians, but Paul's, uh, but Jesus says, if you persecute the Christians, you persecute me. It's like you can't divvy the two parties apart from each other. You can't divvy them up. It's not there's the Christians over there and there's Jesus in over here. It's there's Christ and we are in him and he's in us and what happens to him happens to us and it's incredible, isn't it? Colossians 3.3 3 says, you are hidden with Christ in God. So if we are in Christ, we share in his life, we share in his experience. Um, I believe if we truly believe that, it can change everything everything that we do in life um, think about your suffering for a moment he he was talking about the persecution yeah um, he says if you're being persecuted I'm being persecuted if you suffer he suffers yeah, there's like just a special type of union in everything that you experience together with him um, point number three um, so point number two, um, in Christ, being in Christ means you share in his life. Um, point number three, being in Christ means you share in his benefits. Um, when you think about Christ real quick and all that he has and all that he is, um, I, I, I made a little picture of him um, here that you'll see in the next slide. Um, that's very big, um, uh, but he's even bigger, isn't he? Um, so when we try to put attributes or characteristics of Christ uh, to him, we would say Christ is the Son of God. Yeah, He's God himself and God the Father's Son. We'd also say Christ is righteous. He's the righteous one. We'd also say Christ is holy. He's the holy one. Um, we'd also say Christ is glorious. He's the glorious one. Um, all of those things are true of Christ, and that's why he's so wonderful, and that's why we worship him, yeah? Um, and now we have Galatians 3, verse 27, which says something incredible. It says, um, for all of you were baptized, who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ, if you are baptized into him, in him, if you're in him, you have clothed yourself with him. Um, I happen to um, have uh, um, a little t-shirt with me um, that it's not quite as big, but it has the same words on it as you just saw on Christ. Yeah, we saw Christ is a son. We saw he's righteous, he's holy, he's glorious. And now it says, 
well, you are baptized into Christ, that means we have clothed ourselves with Christ. I'm the master of destroying mics. So if you look at me right now, and I'm in Christ, yeah, and Christ is the Son, and you see me, and I'm hidden with Christ in God, you see me as who? The Son of God. Um, you see me, I'm hidden with Christ in God, in the righteous one, you see me as righteous, as justified. Because yeah? I get the attributes of Christ because I am hidden with him in God. I want to show you this quick. I'm not making this up. Whenever you go through the Bible and you look at um, teachings on justification or on sonship, on adoption, on holiness, you will notice and you'll see it like that Mr. Darcy picture. Yeah, You'll see it from now on um, that the in Christ language is always there. So, for example, um, we have, when we look at the adoption, um, it says in Galatians 3.26, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So, why am I a son of God? Because I'm in Christ Jesus and he is the son of God. Um, just our justification um, Romans 8, 1. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation. Beautiful. No condemnation. There's justification. There's righteousness for those who are where? In Christ Jesus. Um, so why am I justified? Why is there no condemnation? Because I'm in him. And he's the righteous one and he's the just one. Um, Last one, sanctified um, in Christ. First, First Corinthians one thirty, it says, "And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption." Why are we sanctified? How are we sanctified? Because we're in Christ, and He's the Holy One. So we have a positional holiness if we find ourselves placed in Him. So it's important for me because when we look at that list again um, of the adoption and righteousness, and um, that's not just things that you get apart from Jesus. I think that's how I used to picture it. Think about this. Um, if I go to my brother and I give him a birthday gift, yeah, um, there's a couple of options I have. So um, I could, for example, I know he likes comedy. Yeah, he likes to laugh. Okay? So I could um, take tickets for a good comedian. Yeah. And I buy one ticket and I give it to him and I say, go and get your tummy tickled a little bit. Yeah, Go and laugh, have fun. So then he can take the ticket, doesn't matter what I'm doing, who I am, and he can go and get his tummy tickled. Yeah? Um, he can go to the comedy show. Um, doesn't have anything to do with me anymore except that I gave it to him. Right? There's also another option. It's the cheaper option, so I like it. Um, I can also say, hey, brother, I'm your birthday gift. And you know what? I'm funny. Um, and, and then maybe I've memorized some jokes, yeah? And I start telling him the jokes. And so, um, and so suddenly I'm the gift and he doesn't get the tummy tickle apart from me, but because we're together. Um, and I, I believe that's the same thing here. We're not getting things from Jesus. We're not getting sonship and righteousness and holiness from him apart from him. We're getting it because we are put into him. We are in Christ and because he's the son and he's the holy one, we are sons and daughters and we are declared holy. It's not apart from him. It's a gift from him. It's because we are incorporated into him. Um. So in Christ, we share his being, or you might also say his benefits. We are, in a sense, what Christ is. There's clearly still a distinction, yeah? Um, but these benefits clearly are for us because um, I, think that's, I think that's so important for our faith because it means that it shows even more clearly that what you have received in him is nothing that you could have ever done yourself. 
Um, you only have it because you are in, in him and he has done it. He has accomplished it. Your adoption is not because of what you do. It's because you're placed in the son of god and so become a son and daughter um your justification is not because you're better than your work colleagues it's because he's the, the righteous one and you're placed in him um you're sanctified not ultimately because of what you do but you're sanctified because you're placed in the holy one so and that's how i wrap up um being in christ it's your identity yeah your anthropos and christo You're a man, a woman in Christ. Being in Christ is your life. What happens to him happens to you. His suffering is your suffering. Your suffering is his suffering. And being in Christ is your being. You are son and daughter. You are holy. You are righteous because you're in Christ. Um, in real estate, there's this um, famous saying. Some of you might be in real estate. I'm not, and I don't know nothing about it except this. Um, you say the most important thing in real estate is, some of you know it? Location, location, location. Yeah? I want to say the same thing about our faith today. The most important thing about our faith is location, location, location. It's the question of where you are, the question of in whom you are placed. Um, and that's in a sense so mysterious and yet so concrete at the same time. Um, I asked earlier, what, um, what does it mean for me to be a German or for you to be American or wherever you're from? Um, I could ask you many other questions that are also difficult to answer. Like, what are some of your past hurts that you need to be counseled through? How healthy are you? Where are you going in your future? There's so much mystery about us humans and about how we operate and who we are. Um, there's one thing about yourselves that you will know. It's where you are right now. You're here in the Cineplex in Fürth. Everything else in life might be foggy, but your, your location is always concrete. And I think that's, that's the same um, for our faith. There's so many things that are hard to understand. There, there's so many things that are foggy. There's one thing that you can be for certain. It's that if you are Christian, then you are in Christ. You're in Christ here in Cineplex right now, and when you leave later, you will still be in Christ, and no matter where you go, you are in Christ, and Christ is in you. My hope is that as you leave this room, after we're done now, you can never unsee the in Christ references, but that you underline them in your Bible with your brightest colors because I think that's absolutely the key to life and our faith. You are a man, a woman in Christ. And from that flows your life and your being. We want to take a moment now for silence. You can think about what that means for you and how that maybe is touching you. Maybe you can try to sense yourself in a room that you're in right now. You feel the chair that you're sitting in. You smell the air, the smell of popcorn maybe. You feel the temperature if you're warm or cold. You hear the music coming out of the speakers. And there really is no doubt that you really are here. Now maybe you can try to do the same thing with your spiritual senses. Can you sense yourself in Christ? Can you maybe breathe in deeply in the awareness that Christ is all surrounding you and as you breathe in, you breathe in Christ and you breathe out, you breathe out Christ. 
Can you feel his embrace and his presence, his love, his goodness surrounding you? Can you picture yourself in the events of the life of Jesus in an amazing timeless sense that you're there with him in his crucifixion? You're there with him in his burial? You're there with him in his resurrection? And you're there with him in heaven where he now reigns? Jesus, thank you for this amazing truth. Thank you there's, that there's no life for us anymore apart from you, separated from you. But that our very lives is only in you. May you encourage us of this and remind us at all times that we are placed in you so safely. 2 Timothy 2, 11, Paul says, This is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. Amen.